from a very deep understanding of uh, the movement into the physical body and into the physical universe um, uh, uh, we, Georgie, became deeply aware uh, that the whole physical existence is moving through dualities and uh, as we are also a school of non-duality non -duality, so the understanding came forward that behind every duality there is a non-dual position and to work with dualities and the non-dual position is basically a very light way to work with uh, trauma to work with uh, entanglements with patterns and some of the patterns are already running for generations uh, through our families and the difficulty of being born in uh, a dual universe, a dual world, is that we have such a strong tendency to identify with those patterns. So we become those patterns and we get lost in them. And then life becomes like a wheel, what is called karma. It goes around and around and around in the same patterns. And this course is an introduction in a new way to work with this, kind of to find behind those patterns <coughs> the X of the wheel, why this wheel is turning this way. It's looking for an answer, and the answer is always a non-dual position. So, that was a very short introduction, and now I give the word to <laughs> Georgie. <laughs> That's kind of the it really. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I have cheat sheets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. It's the first time. Right. Okay. No, because I want it to be really structured because there's a lot of information. And and there's a danger that it becomes mental, which it's, it's anything but that. It's really uh, giving certain formulas and keys to the art of living and the art of living together, which by itself moves into the art of relating, the art of uh, supporting others in a process. By itself it's the art of working with another in a process as well because it's a, in a very fundamental way there is no other you know it's not like there's a client and a therapist or a student and a teacher these are uh, dualities that are used to give form to give structure but they're not ultimately true there's not superior inferior it's it's not true you know we can say uh, you know i am superior to titya it's just not true uh, that at the moment you get beneath the surface, there's a pure equality, wherever you look at it, whether it's on the physical or whatever. So, <coughs> in working with spiritual psychology and with healing, what we're basically coming up against is suffering also in living, the problem of suffering. And it's not just that we, we want to avoid suffering, it's uh, we really, really want to relieve it in what we see as the other. We want to, to uh, alleviate suffering. It's a natural instinct. Even uh, in a laboratory with rats, they saw that when one rat is locked in a cage, the rats will do everything, use all their resources, all their ingenuity to free that rat. It's like that rat is encaged, I'm encaged. And with an immediate uh, response of joy, chemically seen, the reward chemicals going through the rat's brain after having achieved that. So 
in a way we're looking into the nature of suffering. So suffering these days is often seen as mental. It's a thought, it's in the mind, it's a brain thing. But when you really look to what's happening with thoughts, what thoughts are all about, they are kind of frequencies of energy. And sometimes they freeze, and sometimes it, there's an openness, a kind of clarity. There's, and there's a kind of allowance in the mind for whatever needs to arise, if it needs to arise, and fall away. And then there's much more silence and peace in a way. So thoughts are in themselves are a kind of energy, which means that even thoughts can be felt, or even seen energetically, without knowing the verbal content of the thought. You can feel its mass, you can feel its sense, its resonance, its vibration. So it's in a way also physical, even the thought. When the thoughts contract, and this is known in neuroscience, we become very rigid and we're not able to take in information, we're not able to learn. There is this kind of non-firing of neurons happens, seen on the physical level. When, uh, we f when that same person is affirmed in anything, anything at all, you've got beautiful shoes, anything, there's a relaxation and the neurons start firing again thoughts become more brilliant and more open and more is allowed to come through. So in that way the brain looks like any sense organ. You know, like the eyes, like the ears, like the touch. It's, it's basically saying, like the eyes, if you don't want to see something, if there's something horrific happening there, you go like this. So the brain does the same thing. It's, a, it's an organ of consciousness, in a way. So, given that the brain is physical, which every scientist and materialist will agree, it's a physical organ, then the physical is our starting point. And not just the brain, because the brain is actually an extension of the nervous system which is linked up to the whole physical body. So, our first duality, in a way, and this is recognizable from the healing principle, is the duality of uh, mind, thoughts, thoughts, brain, and heart, feelings. And how to uh, find a third point between this conflict between head and heart, which is in every romantic magazine. You know, yes. so, yeah. <laughs> so, and when you look at it, the one container of head and heart, the one, well, what is the one thing where head and heart are both free to operate? The one space we know, which contains both head and heart. The body. The body, exactly. So the body is the first non-dual position, in a way. It sounds utterly unspiritual, mm. unholy, but it can radically surprise us in that. But the body is the container of head and heart. When we bring our attention, and this is at any moment of stress or a feeling of conflict, to the physical body, then this stuff can do what it needs to do. There's a kind of surrender in it. So there's a surrender and a movement of trust that actually there's an intelligence here for it to find its way, for the right direction to come forward between head and heart, just by letting the attention moved to the body, to the feet, walking. I was with a dentist and I don't like the dentist. And I was, oh, I don't want to be here. I wanted to stop and obviously she didn't. And then think about your toes, think about your toes, think about your... And that helps. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and it, it's not a small thing. Because uh, our apparent safety here is in the body. It's the slowest, most constant factor we have for a little while. Doesn't matter if it's a painful body or a pleasurable body, but it's the most uh, uh, tangible first point of call. Everybody can feel the body. Doesn't even matter if the body's changing shape or bits are falling off, it, it's <laughs> teeth are getting extracted. <laughs> it's still this is a contact point. So when we're working with non-dual therapy, what we look at is, and this is of, of course also applying to the body, but that's more medical, 
And it's the same principle, but in, on the energetic level of head and heart, we're looking at contractions where something freezes inside itself. So, we are many human beings and there's no, in naturalness there's no reason for any freeze to take place. There's no need, there's no need unless there is a, a suffering, a shock, a non-containability. And then there is this uh, kind of energetic, and it can be felt, kind of a block or contraction that takes place in order to buy time in a way, in order to buy space. Like for now, I can't deal with it. In real time, the physical can't deal with this. So a contraction is a contraction in time and a contraction of space. Both are limited. And that makes a form. Because every form, every thing, whether it's a vase or it's a hand or a flower, is a combination of time and space. It's aging and it takes up a certain amount of space. Like that's what forms are made of. So we kind of create a form in a way out of a reflex in this contraction. And this form tends to take place exactly where we meet what is perceived as other, the other one. So if our mother shames us, and it's just too painful, it's too dissonant, then we form like a shield here. Something contracts, something in our innocence, something in our purity contracts because we don't want this to uh, hurt and to activate all the brain centers, of pain centers of the brain. So these contractions are very much where we consider ourselves to be separate from others. It's like the cement of the separate self. You know, in non-duality there's a lot of talking, we are all one, we are all one, we are all one, but basically at a somatic level, at a kind of deep unconscious level, we feel that there is a separation. And we can find all kinds of reasons to say why I'm not one, why there's difference. But though that's the mental spin. What's actually happening there is there is an energetic stuff between ourselves and others in the form of contractions, which is made of, which is basically saying this should not be touched. So a key feature of a contraction, which what you mean is that from from, from the body and from the um, the whole. There is a kind of wall, cement, or something like you said, why we cannot pass that through yeah. to come to the uh, hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a, in the healing terms of healing principle, this is an energetic block. Okay. It's just a block. And it feels like <coughs> when you close your eyes and you kind of relax into the physical, it almost feels physical. You can feel a block. Even away from the body, you can feel blocked bits. It's really to do with feeling. And you feel them in the body as well? Yeah. yeah. They start the contractions. Yeah, and behind. Yeah. Yes. You know, the back, is, the muscles of the back are very responsive to, uh, yes. to the freeze as well. And yeah. it's, it's the illusion of thinking I'm separate from, from the other, from the No, it's, 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 it's before thinking. It's before thinking any thought. It's an energetic reflex because, you know, if a two-year-old baby, you know, a two-year-old baby is in total unity with his mother. And the first, th the first gentle and beautiful introduction to togetherness a baby has is to begin to learn the mother's face in mm -hmm. a harmony, in a togetherness. But if the mother, for whatever reason, whether it's social pressure or uh, her own patterns or anything, is like putting, has a contraction herself even, then the mother becomes other. But it hurts like hell. So for the baby, this is, and the baby is pure naturalness, in, in a way, pure survival. So it's like physical pain. Mm -hmm. So when there's a physical knife coming towards you, you go like this. Mm -hmm. So this is, and the physical is also energy. So, and it, the muscles around it are doing it as well, like literally in the area. And, and then there's this sentient block uh, created. So a key feature of these contractions is that they feel much less. They don't feel. The, f the feeling quality is m vastly reduced there because the agenda is not to feel it. And it, it's an agenda because otherwise it's registered as an incredible pain. And 
we've said before, but it's maybe important to say again, that the pain of rejection, for example, is registered in the brain as if you were actually stabbed with a knife. It's the same area of the brain that lights up. That's how much it hurts. You know, when we're really in a, a sorrow, it can be literally, the feeling can be like we're bleeding out, but that's actually what the brain is experiencing on the level of survival. There's no blood shed, but the feeling can be like you're just bleeding out, just bleeding out. So, there's no judgment about contractions. They are natural reflexes to protect until there is the time and the space for a kind of reunion of the substance of the contraction back to its uh, source. It's not something that came from the outside, it's made of what we are. But the uh, movement of the contraction, what's embedded in it is there is no time and no space for this. You kind of take the time out of it, like you don't invest any time in it, and, you and, and, and it's given no space. It's contracted. It's like the sorrow can't move <coughs> through, the rejection can't move through. It's like, that's, that's what a contraction is. It's a reduction of time and space, a limitation, a condition. So... It freezes, in a way, out of time and space. It's like frozen time and frozen space. Yes. So, together with, like, let's say you're giving therapy or you're in a in a in a um, entanglement with somebody. Uh, the, the basic first duality is to move, to position yourself in out of, in a way, is. Uh, from heart and head to kind of relax the body, everyone can do that. So this person's talking and telling the most horrible stories and you're with your attention on the physical body, which by itself will become their physical body. The more you relax through the firing of mirror neurons, the more they are going to relax their body as well. So the first non-dual position is relaxing the body. The second, and it comes together, the, sec the next two come together with that in a way, is you move into the present moment. You move out of this uh, duality of past and future. So this is a major duality in every story. What happened and that, what th that says about what's going to happen. And in the middle you've got this non-dual position, the present moment, which is uh, utterly boundless. It's utterly? Boundless. boundless. It's, it's, it, it's, got, it's eternal. It's not caught in time. Just the simple present moment. So in a way, on the time level, what every contraction is looking for is, is that, all the time in the world. Because it's contracted in time, so it needs all the time. So on an attitude level, when somebody's got an issue, it's really important to give it all the time, even if it takes years or lifetimes. And out of that present moment, this is possible. It's of itself, with a kind of magic, takes out this whole linear <coughs> story of I've got a problem, I must get rid of it, there's a beginning point, there's an end point, all of this is past and future. So the now, as, it, as Eckhart Tolle says, is an incredibly healing factor in any context, with ourselves, with others, and especially with contractions. <coughs> when they have all the time, when they have a, a drop of eternity, they start to unfold through all the dimensions of themselves. There's this relief. So the more we contact the present moment and, and become uh, consolidated in the present moment, in the now, the more we become free in uh, relating to the other, so-called so other, in whatever form. And it's connected to the body, because in a way, for a lot of us, the body is other. You know, you can't actually come into the body except in the present moment. It's not something we can do yesterday or later. Yeah. So the other one, uh, which is fundamental, is, is space. The uh, 
giving of uh, infinite space, boundless space, to the contraction. Now that means that there is suddenly a freedom around the contraction that it's not the universe, this energetic freeze. It's not like the elephant in the, in the, in the tiny room. It's, you can give it infinite space and it can become from the perspective of infinite space, space around it, space before it, behind it, space inside it. You can, you can uh, give it by itself a kind of softness in which it begins to unfold. This hold, which uh, is so programmed to keep the contraction, often it's supported by our family and friends and environment to keep this locked, is relieved immensely just by the relativity of space. There's all the space for this. As it is, this contraction has the whole universe to be in. It also takes the grandiosity out of the contraction. But the other thing about infinite space is that it's not just infinitely out there in expansion. Infinite space is also zero distance. Infinity goes both ways. So to the precise nanoparticle of an energetic contraction, the tiniest, tiniest little detail, you can go into total zero distance. And that's the, uh, very, very powerful hearing, the, the courage to go into it put it really simply. That's also a kind of infinity. It's a kind of reunion. And it doesn't mean the whole contraction, it can be the tiniest, 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 minuscule pinprick part of the contraction. It's enough to move into zero distance. You know, no space is no space. It's just where it gets caught in the middle, you've got a contraction, whether it's the infinite expanse or the total unity. So, in sitting with others in a struggle or in a conflict, the uh, feeling of spaciousness, that there's all the space, is very, very, very important. And it's a resonance. It's a resonance which is transmitted. If somebody's sitting and they're very much like, okay, this is where I begin and this is where I end, you know, I end with my, just here, like with the, just somewhere inside my aura, then that's a kind of sitting in a contraction. If you sit as infinity, it's just infinite space. It's got a totally different resonance to it. Does that make sense? <laughs>